they said, as I said, we're going to continue our look at where we see Jesus in the Old Testament, this time looking at where we see Jesus in the Psalms. We'll be focusing today on Psalm 16, but before we read these words together, let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Lord God, help us to turn our hearts to you and to hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. So Psalm 16, Psalm of David. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so as I said this past Sunday, we started a new series on Jesus in the Old Testament. Where do we see Jesus? In the Old Testament? Where does he come up? We looked at how it's, it is okay for us to do this, to, to dig into the Old Testament, specifically looking for Jesus, because the truth is he's already there. As Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, this all points to me. The scriptures bear witness to me. And so we started last week with the prophets, particularly with the prophet Ezekiel, but the passage that we looked at last week, Ezekiel chapter 36, there, there was no direct reference to Jesus there. He wasn't mentioned by name in that passage. And this, this isn't even one of the Old Testament passages that gets quoted, at least not directly anywhere in the New Testament. But you still see Jesus there. Ezekiel describes how one day God is going to give his people a new heart. He's going to put a new spirit, his spirit, in them so that they can start to live again as his people. And in, in passages like that, you see Jesus in the outline, so to speak. Ezekiel talks very openly, very clearly about this gap that sin has put between us and God. But it's in Jesus that God overcomes that gap, that, that divide, that separation. So now this week, we're looking at the Psalms. Where do we see Jesus in the Psalms? And especially in a Psalm like Psalm 16, things are a little different than they are with a passage like Ezekiel chapter 36. For starters, Psalm 36 does get quoted directly in the New Testament, actually in two different occasions. Uh, the Apostle Paul mentions the psalm in a sermon that he preaches in Pisidian Antioch. That sermon is recorded in Acts chapter 13. But then you have it before that, Peter quotes from Psalm 16 during his famous Pentecost sermon. And when you think about what was going on on that particular Pentecost, you can kind of see why Peter would go to this psalm, why he would go to Psalm 16. On this particular Pentecost, Jesus' disciples, they'd all been together when, when suddenly the Holy Spirit is poured out on each of them. There is this sound like that of a rushing wind, and, and Jesus' followers, they all start speaking in different languages, in different tongues, 
and the people in the crowd that had started to gather, they all want to know, how, how is this possible? What's, what's going on here? And Peter, Peter right away stands up and he explains this, what you are seeing right now, this is the fulfillment of God's promises. This is happening because of Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, whom you helped put to death, he is alive. This man, Jesus, God really was with him. He had God's full approval. And so it was impossible for death to stop him. And so, so what happened to Jesus, according to Peter, that fits exactly with what David said back in Psalm 16, where he says, you will not abandon me to the grave. You will not let your Holy One see decay. And so it, it makes sense that Peter would go to this psalm in light of what he and Jesus' other disciples had just seen and experienced. What David writes there, that would have made sense to them. For Peter, what Psalm 16 says about how God would not abandon his Holy One to death, that's a sign. That's evidence that Jesus is, in fact, Lord and Christ. But all that, all that still raises a, a pretty good question, I think. What David says in Psalm 16 about not being left in the grave, about not seeing decay, you know, all, all of that makes sense from Peter's point of view, especially after his encounters with the risen Lord. But what would that have meant to David? You think about it, why would David have written something like this? David lived roughly 1,000 years before Jesus' time on earth. Would David have really understood this idea that God would actually raise up someone from the dead? And to be honest, that, that is an important question for us to think about. One of the leaders in the, the Church of England, N.T. Wright, wrote a book called Surprised by Hope, which I read a few years ago. And in that book, N.T. Wright points out how almost nobody back in the ancient world actually believed in the concept of resurrection. Now, they, they would have understood what that term meant. They would have understood the idea that, that hypothetically speaking, someone could come back to life after having died, not, not just as a ghost or as a spirit, but they could possibly come back as a living, breathing being. So they understood the concept, but still no one in the ancient world really believed that such a thing was actually possible. As Wright explains, most ancient people believed that once you die, once you die, that was it. In his own words, the road to the underworld ran only one way. And so it was generally accepted that the soul, the soul continued some sort of shadowy existence in the afterlife in Hades or Sheol. But once you were there, there was no coming back. And there were even some ancients like the philosopher Plato who argued that you shouldn't, you shouldn't want to come back. And then again, as far as Plato was concerned, the physical body was, was simply a prison that, that kept the soul in bondage. For Plato, death was really a, a liberation. It was releasing the soul from captivity. And so that's, that's how most people, most people in the ancient world thought about the idea of resurrection. They understood the concept, but they didn't really believe it was possible. And there was really only one notable exception, and that, that was the people of Israel, the Jews. Now, the Jews, the Jews were already unique in the ancient world because they were among the few peoples that insisted there was only one God, not many. But then the people of Israel, they also believed that this one God, he had created humanity, that God created people not just to serve him as slaves. He didn't create them as some kind of accident or afterthought, but they believed the Jews believed that God had created us in his own image. God created us so that we could have life, real life, life with him. And so the Israelites, not only did they believe that God was the only God, but they also believed that this one God had created human beings in a special way for himself. Now that belief that belief in one God who created humanity for himself, that belief had other implications. 
For starters, it meant that this physical life we have, this physical existence, it's not a bad thing. It's not something to, to be escaped. Rather, the ancient Israelites, they understood that to be fully human, that means having, existing as both body and soul. That is how God made us. But then coming, coming from that perspective, the ancient Israelites also recognized that death, death is an enemy. Death is not normal. They recognized that death in the sense of the separation of body and soul, that was not part of God's original plan for us. Rather, death is the result of a break in the relationship between God and us. Death is the result of sin. God had warned Adam and Eve of that back in the garden. He told them, if you eat from that one tree, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And so the ancient Israelites, they saw death not as, as an existence, but they saw it as separation, but, but not just the separation of the soul from the body either. They saw death as a separation from life. They saw death as a separation from the only true life possible, which is life with God. And all of that. All of that kind of comes out in what David says in Psalm 16. Now, it's not, it's not exactly clear at what point in his life did David write this particular psalm. But looking at what he says there, it seems likely by this time he was king. Things seem to be going pretty good for David. He talks, for instance, in verses 5 and 6 about how God had made his lot secure. He talks about how the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And so it could be that David David wrote this psalm sometime during the early years of his reign. He's no longer on the run from Saul. He's, he's overcome his other enemies by this point. Things in general are going pretty good. But David, David is still very much aware of how quickly things can change. He still has vivid memories of how he had been forced to run for his life. He still has vivid memories of how he had basically been forced to live as an exile. And that, that comes out in the way that he begins this psalm. He pleads with God, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. Now, at this point, He's surrounded now by, by people who share his outlook, who share his convictions. David talks in verse 3 about the saints who are in the land and how much he delights in them. And yet he still recognizes from, from his experience of living in exile and, and probably also from Israel's own history, there's still that, that huge temptation to try and hedge your bets. David recognizes there's that temptation to try and find your security elsewhere. David knows that there are people out there who run after other gods, not, not that it gets them anywhere. Now, in a way, David seems to end up answering his own prayer. He asks God to be his refuge, but then in verse 2, he points out how he has already said to God, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. And then in verse 8, David declares how I will not be shaken. He keeps his focus on God. It, for him, it's like God is at his right hand, ready to help. But then what, what is really going on here is John Piper, who was, was pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Piper has pointed out that this is all part of what it means to claim God, to claim God as your security, as your refuge. What, what David is describing here, this isn't just something that happens automatically. Just because you feel you've been chosen by God, it doesn't mean that you can then just go on autopilot. You can't just think, well, it doesn't matter what I do now because God, he's got me. I'm good to go. But as Piper points out, refuge, refuge is not automatic. It is interactive. With God's promises, there also comes an expectation of obedience that we will start living as God's people. And with that, there's also an expectation of trust, an expectation of submission. God expects us, as David does, to, to actively seek his counsel, to seek his leading for life. 
in times of crisis, we don't just, just we don't just get to say, hey, you know, no worries, God will protect me. I don't have to do anything. Rather, our attitude should be that, that because, because I trust that God has got me, I also commit myself to striving to live out my life his way, according to his will. And that, that is all part of what it means to live in a covenant relationship with God. And so in Psalm 16, we, we see that emphasis on, on monotheism, how the ancient Israelites, they insisted there is only one God. And David puts his trust, he commits his life into the care of this one true God. But there is also in Psalm 16 this clear sense that, that this one God, what he ultimately wants for his people is that they have life, true life, that they have life lived in fellowship with him. David, David probably recognized that he was more blessed than most. God had taken him from, from watching over sheep and made him king over his people. But David still looks beyond all the material blessings, and he recognizes what God is really after, that, that God wants to see his people, all of them, flourish. He wants to see them thrive. Sin has disrupted that. Death now robs us of life. But it seems, it seems that what David is starting to recognize here is that if what God is really after, if what God really wants is to live in relationship with his people, then he is not going to let death continue to get in the way of that. And that's where verses 9 and 10 of Psalm 16 come in. That's, that is what compels David to declare, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy one, your chosen one, see decay. Now, you could, you could try arguing with that. You could argue that what David was talking about here was not being raised from the dead, but, but maybe all David was really asking for in Psalm 16 is that God would, would keep him from dying, at least for the time being. Lord, don't let me be taken too soon. But when you look at what David says, he, he does seem to have something more than that in mind. In verse 11, for instance, David talks about how God will fill me with joy in his presence, with eternal pleasures at his right hand. And that idea of, of living in God's presence, that actually connects back to how death is, is described in Genesis 2 and 3 as a separation from God. Death is the result of sin. But if the power of sin could only be broken, if, if there was some way to overcome that obstacle between us and God, David seems to sense that there is a way. And you could maybe argue, too, that all David is really hoping for in Psalm 16 is that he would have some kind of existence after death. Maybe Maybe all he was expecting here is what almost everyone else in the ancient world expected, that his soul or his spirit would, would somehow continue after death. But again, you look at what David says in Psalm 16. He talks about how my body, not just my soul or my spirit, but my body will rest secure. And he insists that God will not abandon me to the grave. And so the way David talks here, it really seems that he is expecting more than just some kind of spiritual existence that would continue after death. And then Jonathan Mason points this out in his study of Psalm 16. It could very well be that, that David was inspired to write this particular psalm after he had met with the prophet Nathan and, and heard the prophecy that's recorded in 2 Samuel 7. What happens there is that God sent Nathan to tell David, first of all, that, that as much as God appreciated the thought, he did not need David to build a house, to build a temple for him. The reality is God is the one who is going to establish David's house, his line. 
But then through Nathan, God goes on to tell David that after your days are over and you rest with your fathers, after you die, God is going to raise up another king from David's line, from his descendants. And this king, this king, God says, his throne and his kingdom will last forever. And so it's there in, in what Nathan says. There is this hint, this hope that through this descendant of David, God will one day defeat death once and for all. And so what does that mean for us? For one thing, I think this adds weight to what Peter says in his Pentecost sermon that, that we referred to earlier, the one in Acts chapter 2. When, when Peter goes back to Psalm 16, he's not just going for the first proof text that pops in his head. Rather, from Peter's perspective, what David is saying in Psalm 16, that shows that what is happening on Pentecost, this, this has been part of God's plan all along. What happened on that particular Pentecost, the way people got to see the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out, that is proof, that is a sign that the gap between us and God has finally been overcome. The coming of the Holy Spirit, that really is a sign that, that sin and death have been defeated. How? In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Peter explains, this Jesus who had been crucified, he is now Lord and Christ. He has made forgiveness of sins possible. He has made it possible for us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, this gift of God's presence. Because he has defeated death, because God raised him up to new life. And that also means then that, that we get to claim for ourselves what David says in Psalm 16 about Jesus. We get to apply what he says, that says there to ourselves. You, you think about what it means, for instance, when we recite the Apostles' Creed together. There's those lines that, about how I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the life everlasting. What David is describing in Psalm 16 reinforces this, this what, what God has in store for us. Through Jesus, we get to be part of God's new creation. God is not going to abandon this world, and he's not going to abandon us either to death and decay. In Christ, he has promised us new life. We get to begin living that new life now. And I realize at the moment, especially, it's not easy for us to always identify with what David is saying here. He talks about having confidence in God's security, whereas there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of insecurity out there. We are in the middle of another lockdown. and It's forced us to make some tough choices. We don't want to see anyone else get sick, but it is taking a toll, these restrictions. We're, we're anxious about what will happen. What will happen when our kids have to go back to school tomorrow? We're anxious about what the uh, economic fallout of the pandemic is going to be. The boundary lines don't seem to have fallen in such pleasant places for us. At the same time, though, the fact we're able to recognize that things are not right. In a way, that is an affirmation of what David says. We recognize we're not meant for this kind of existence. We were meant to enjoy the life God has given us. God's original intent would be that we would flourish, that we would thrive. But then what we also get from everything David says in, in Psalm 16, there is that call to put our trust in God, to find our refuge, our security in him. Even when things don't go as planned, what happens to us still matters to God. He has still got us. Because the truth is we are part of a much bigger story. And at the heart of that story, what it all points to is Jesus. Amen. Let's again come to God in prayer. Almighty and loving God. 
We bless you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord, we pray and all of God's people said, Amen.